Uh, my name's Jose Luis Sanchez. I'm a retired United States Marine. Um, born and raised in San Antonio, Texas. I just wanted to get out, do something different. Um, I, so I just joined the Marine Corps um, like two months before graduating. Uh, I just wanted to get out experiencing something different. I've always liked physical things and I was gonna join the military. I might as well join something the best. And I always felt like the Marine Corps was always, you know, the toughest and the hardest uh, um, to become. So I wanted to challenge myself. Well, I wanna do something, I'm gonna do it right. I'm gonna do it big. So I, you know, joined the Marine Corps. It was totally different. It was so different from what I've uh, ever experienced. It was surreal. It was a cultural shock. Every day, like, I, I've, I fought hard. Like, I, I try to run the hardest or I'll PT uh, everyone and I, I try to lead by example. And, and they put me in a squad leader position, you know? So um, it was hard at first, you know? It, it, it was just a, a total um, shock, different environment. And, um, People were bumping heads. We weren't getting along very much, but through the pain and suffering that we all went through together, that brought us together. It was crazy. I hated it, man. I, I just disliked it. I couldn't, I couldn't wait to get out. Um, you know, I was always a strong-minded person. I always liked doing things how I saw fit. And being in the Marine Corps, it was rules, and it was very strict, and uh, you had to, you had to know, you, you had to come with it, man. You couldn't just be, uh, you, you couldn't be weak, man. You had to know what your job, you had to be strong, you had to be fit, you had to uh, know what to do, when to do it, execution. Like the responsibility you had was, was um, enormous for like t a 20 year old, you know, making sure like, you know, equipment straight, um, gears accountable. Um, you got to look out for your, you know, your brothers and stuff. So like, like it's a lot of responsibility, and it was just nothing that I was used to, um, and I didn't like it at all. But it was something I had to do. Um, so when I got news that I was going to Iraq, you know, the first war, and like, you know, after 9/11, and like how many people, you know, were dying, the news and everything is like you, you. When I got the news, you. You don't want to think about it. You just your body just goes numb. Uh, once we we landed in country, it was it was like that. Like deep down inside, yeah, I was scared, but you couldn't show that to to the, to your brothers or to other Marines, man, because you want to freak them out or you don't want to feel like or or let them know that you're you're scared or or you're weak or anything. So you gotta you gotta be strong for them and you gotta be strong and you gotta keep your head up high and and be brave, man. Every day was small arms fire, SVBIDs, IEDs, RPGs. Um, people getting killed, man. It was it was a war zone. Like every day, that's how I went, um, you know. But we're working hard, tirelessly, like every every day, man. Fucking working night, um, day in and day out. And like war was was natural. It was normal, man. Getting shot at, um, hearing explosions. That's how life was. You don't really think about people dying. You just know it's gonna happen. Um, it just, it's the roll of the dice. It's not even, it's, it's not about like, oh, or if, it's, it's just like when, and it's just something that you just gotta live with. It's, it's just, that's life, you know? It's, it's, you're used to it, you know? Like, oh, people dying, it's just like, man, you gotta continue to fight, man. You can't let that draw you back. Like, I know it's probably like crazy or like a savage way of thinking about it, man, but, if everybody were to dwell on it and not push forward, then we wouldn't progress. I think it was two months before exiting the Marine Corps, I went in and asked them like, okay, the only way I'll, I'll re-enlist is like, if y'all give me my preferred duty assignment and with the bonus. And you know, luckily they had San Antonio and a bonus, so I re-enlisted. You know, materialistic stuff, man, and I, I re-enlisted. Um, I went to San Antonio did, and you know, I did everything I said I was do. And, but I was there, right? But I was, you know, scheduled to have like, you know, three years in San Antonio, but they gave me minimum like, a, like two years. And right after my first year, they already had cut me orders to go to a new duty station, uh, First Anglico in California. So here we go again. And that's when um, we were getting geared up to go to, to war in Afghanistan. It was like the Wild West, man. Every day things were, were going off. Um, 
um, firefights. And uh, Afghanistan was a different war for me. Um, it was out in the country where more of a, a search, searching, um, search and seeking. And, and with that, you know, we're, we're trying to lead the uh, ANA, Afghan Ash National Army, um, on patrols and trying to show them how to conduct the patrols and how to conduct uh, um, weapons handling, um, inspection, patrolling, and and to take care of their uh, territory. It it was it was a different it was a different pace. Where's the fight, man? Where is it at? And it, it was just driving me crazy. Why are we here? Where is it? Where's the fight? Why we're like wasting our time? We were just frustrated, man. It, you know, overall as as a whole. This one day, we're um, going out on patrol. Me and uh, another uh, U.S. Marine uh, captain, um, Captain Hippo, myself, along with a couple of uh, British Marines, and um, we went out on patrol. And that day, um, the ANA, Afghan National Army, didn't want to go out, so we had to continue um, to show them that lead by example and go out and, and conduct a patrol that day um, so we're out uh, doing a, a patrol a security patrol through uh, through our AO um, we're going out about 10 minutes into it we hear a voice chatter um, coming in um, saying that you know the Americans are coming out um, everybody get ready we know they're out there but we can't see them they're hiding, um, so everybody's on, you know, on alert, and you know, you know, we're just heightened senses and everything. And every, every every movement, we're like, I'm clicking, I'm seeing, um, we're pushing out, we're moving, and I'm just like, like my head on a swivel, just waiting for something to pop off. I'm just waiting for that moment, tensed every every inch, every every step, you know, everyone's taking. I'm just, you know, being ready, ready and prepared for some something to go off. So we're patrolling, we're, we're getting closer and closer. Um, so, you know, my head's in a swivel, my head's in a swivel, seeing what's going on. And as soon as I looked up and I saw my, you know, my captain, he saw my eyes, I saw his eyes. And as soon as he actually looked into my eyes, that's when, boom, man, like out of nowhere, like, you know, getting blindsided by a 300 pound linebacker out of nowhere, felt like just came in and like hit me. Um, and then, I came to and I was like disoriented days in that ringing that you, you, you see, man. And that was ha happening, like ringing in both ears. And I was disoriented. I was like, oh, shit, like what's going on? Like I, w I didn't understand. And then I was like, whoa, I, we're under attack. So I picked up my M4, like I'm ready for a follow up. So all this stuff, like rules and engagement, follow up IEDs, daisy chains, um, where I'm at, uh, positive. Um, identification, just making sure uh, situation awareness, everything was cloudy, then that smoke cleared. At that point, I looked down and then I noticed my, my legs covered in blood. And at that point, then that started registering like, shit, I, I got hit by IED, I stepped on IED. I moved one leg and I was like, fuck, I can't move this leg. And then I moved my other leg. I can move this leg, so I was like hopeful. Well, at least I got one leg. And I was like, well, I was already thinking about like, maybe I, I'll, I'll recover from this. I mean, I'm good. At least I got one leg, you know, I'm good. British Marines came to my, to my aid. Um, it, was, it was funny because it, it was a young British, uh, British Marine and uh, he was just spazzing out like all crazy and like, like fumbling around with all his stuff. And like, oh, he, he just looked scared. I felt bad for him. I was like, man, it's... Like, I just wanted to tell him, like, dude, it's cool, like, calm down. And then that's when I saw uh, my, my, my captain come in and call in, um, hey, you know, um, calling my numbers and, like, you know, a Marine down and calling uh, a medevac to come in, uh, medevac me out. One Brit got behind me and another Brit got in front of me. And as soon as he picked me up by my legs and picked me up, um, I just saw my leg just slide right off of slide slide off the bone of, of 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 my leg man it just slid right off and i was like damn man it it was like i was like just just put me down man i actually saw my leg detached from my body i was like you know just put me down um put me on the litter um the stretcher just bring the litter out and put me on there because uh yeah it wasn't gonna work this way um they put me on the litter and i was like bring my leg man like my legs there bring it 
with me because that's my leg, man. I had that for like 20 some odd years, right? So like bring my leg. I want it, man. Don't leave it there. I was in pain. Nothing helped, man. But this, this thing, I, I'll just tell you right now. Um, I, was, I was in so much pain, but I was like, I was brought up like Catholic and my mom doing, you know, everything like that. So religious, I was like, dude, I was like, God, man, I, I know, fuck shit, man. I, I'm fucked up or whatever. I'm like, but please, if you can, just give me like five minutes of peace, man. I would, I would appreciate it. Like, just please, just let me be in peace for five minutes. And I kid you not, man. I, I, you know, I, I, on fucking on everything or whatever. Like, I promise you, like within those five minutes, I had peace. Those five minutes, just asking for for that peace for that five minutes, and I was able to get that peace for five minutes. So living in the hospital and going to rehab, you're with other people that are wounded in the same conditions you are. So it felt normal. Like I felt in a, in a nice, comfortable environment. Um, everybody knew, you know, about injuries. Nobody looked at you differently or saw you or thought of you any differently. So it was just a normal feeling, a normal environment. And uh, as soon as I got home, for the first time out of the hospital, I got off of the van through the wheelchair and coming into this door, growing up, in and out, running through those doors, in and out, um, back and forth, <laughs> just like with, you know, with everything, like, you know, my, my, my legs and like just being fun, man, just doing what I had to do in sports and like just being a kid, man, and coming back home and fucking going in that shit in a, like a wheelchair was different. Um, and then, uh, so my mom was like, asking me we're at the dinner table and like asked me what was wrong and I had told her nothing, nothing was wrong. But like deep down, like I knew something changed. <clears throat> like that's when it started hitting me. Like <clears throat> that, that I was, that I was different. That I wasn't the same person anymore. Before, like everything I did and everything I felt and everything I went through, like I went through alone and I felt like this was a thing I had to go through alone. Like I had to fix it. Like, so I, I started suppressing those feelings, like everything. So I was like, I knew they were there. Then I started like squashing them and like and suppressing them deep down in, 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 in me and not even thinking about it. And then, and then I was like, man, fuck this. Then I started getting angry. And then I just started going to the gym more, more often and, and going harder. And they were like, hey, man, you, you need to lay off your leg. And I was like persistent, like, no, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push some more. I'm going to keep on pushing. And every time I pushed, I set back my leg. My leg would reopen up or the wounds would open back up. And, and it looked bad. And I was like, fuck that, dude. Like, I didn't care, dude. Like, I was, I was obsessed now. So whoever I was before, like, I was going to be better than, than that person. So I started hitting the squat, squat machine, the, the squat racks. And I started going further and further, um, walking with weights, um, carrying it, and then lifting it over my head and not going farther distance and then squatting, like, 80 pounds, 100, 200, 300, until like I was, I was up to 400 pounds, man. I was just like beasting it day in and day out um, um, physically, man. So I was there all day, every day, man. And I, I covered up, man. I covered up all my wounds and I started like lifting weights and lifting hard, man. And I was like obsessed with it, like deadlifting, uh, squatting, like three, three, 400, like, like outrageous amounts of weight on my prosthetics. And Every time, like, I would, I would break prosthetics and I would go back and get a new prosthetic because I kept on breaking them. And that time, you know, I was still afraid of my injuries and, and showing people my injuries. Every time I would go to the gym, I was always covered up and closed up. Um, I never, I, I was never um, comfortable with, with people seeing my, my injuries still. But, you know, I would go to, to the gym with, with sweatpants and always covered up and, like, fucking beast it and hit it hard and, and go out. But, you know, I was like, well, I want to try something different. So I would like do a little video saying like I'm a, I'm a you know injured marine, and I would do a, do a little video, and then slowly but surely I would I would uh, strip away layers of clothes until I finally revealed that 
I was, um, that I had a prosthetic and I lost my leg and I was afraid that they were gonna look at me like I was weak or, or, or ugly or, or like, like pitiful, man. But I was like, well, this is, this is a way I could give back. And that's, that's what triggered everything. Like, well, if I could do this and give back and inspire and motivate people, then I'm gonna do that. And that gave me another spark, man. Um, that just like, like just felt good spiritually, mentally, man. And then the physical part, I've always done that, but it gave me a, a, a jolt, a, a, a new sense of purpose to be like, yeah, man, I'm gonna give back, you know? So that's when I started doing more things, like more videos and exposing myself more to the public. Don't be afraid. The, the biggest thing is fear. Fear, that's the most crippling thing out of everything is, is that fear, that, that fear of failure, that fear of, of people looking down at you and, and pitying you and like, and, and, and just that fear. That's the biggest thing is sometimes you just gotta be like, fuck you fear, man, fuck fear, man, and just fucking do it, man. Just go out there and be you and do what you need to do, man, to, to, to get in it and keep on fighting.